Welcome to the Dakota Live podcast. I'm your host, Robert Morier. The goal of this podcast is to help you better know the people behind investment decisions. We introduce you to chief investment officers, manager research professionals, sales leaders, and other important players in the industry to help you sell in between the lines and better understand the investment sales ecosystem. If you're not familiar with Dakota and their Dakota Live content, please check out dakota.com to learn more about their services. Uh, before we get started, I need to read a brief disclosure. This content is provided for informational purposes and should not be relied upon as recommendations or advice about investing in securities. All investments involve risk and may lose money. Dakota does not guarantee the accuracy of any of the information provided by the speaker who is not affiliated with Dakota. Not a solicitation, testimonial, or an endorsement by Dakota or its affiliates. Nothing herein is intended to indicate approval, support, or recommendation of the investment advisor or its supervised persons by Dakota. Today's episode is brought to you by Dakota Marketplace. Are you tired of constantly jumping between multiple databases and channels to find the right investment opportunities? Introducing Dakota Marketplace the comprehensive institutional and intermediary database built by fundraisers for fundraisers. With Dakota Marketplace, you'll have access to all channels and asset classes in one place, saving you time and streamlining your fundraising process. Say goodbye to the frustration of searching through multiple databases and say hello to a seamless and efficient fundraising experience. Sign up now and see the difference Dakota Marketplace can make for you. Visit dakotamarketplace.com today. Well, I am thrilled to introduce our audience uh, to my special guest today, Mel Lindsay, Managing Partner at Nile Capital Group. Mel, welcome to the show. Robert, nice to see you. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure having a conversation with you. Oh, well, thank you so much. Uh, I was starting to get a little nervous. We had some technical difficulties in the beginning and I was trying to get it up and running. I felt like I was your client service associate again, like trying to get ready for the meeting before uh, before the client came in so we could get everything done perfectly. So it, it brought back some very, uh, actually some very warm memories of those early days. So thanks for your patience with us. Well, well you always rose to the occasion when we were, we were working together. So I need to get it together. <laughs> Blind ignorance. I didn't know what I was doing, so I just tried everything. <laughs> well, we have a lot of questions to ask you, Mel, but before we do, I want to quickly share your background with our audience. Uh, Mel Lindsay is the founder and managing partner of Nile Capital Group, a private equity firm that invests in GP stakes of innovative, performance-driven asset management companies. He serves on the boards of Nile's portfolio holding companies, including Welton Investment Partners, Britannia Asset Management, Cavassar Technologies, Wilshire Lane Capital, Strategic Global Advisors, Denali Advisors, and Convergence Investment Partners. Prior to founding Nile, Mel co-managed Julius Baer Investment Management as Managing Director of Global Distribution. During his tenure at JBIM, assets under management grew from $800 million to a peak of $78 billion, ultimately resulting in an IPO and listing on the New York Stock Exchange in 2009. Mel previously worked at Investec Asset Management as Director in the Institutional North American Division. He was also Managing Director and Portfolio Manager at Wells Capital Management uh, and a Vice President at Shearson Lehman Brothers. Uh, Mel holds the CFA designation and received his MBA from UCLA School of Management. Uh, Mel has also attended IMD Global Leadership Program in Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, he's a member of the Los Angeles Society of Financial Analysts. Mel serves on the Board of Trustees and the Investment Committee for the California Health Care Foundation, the UCLA Foundation Board, UCLA Anderson School of Management Board of Advisors, and St. John's Health Center Foundation. Finally, and most importantly, Mel calls Los Angeles home where he lives with his family. Mel, thank you again for being here today and congratulations on all your success. Again, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Well, we are as well. I always love when people uh, who are mentioned on prior episodes uh, get to come on as guests. You're one of those people. I had the, the pleasure of interviewing Shanae Edwards of NEPC uh, about a month or two back, and we, we both shared a similar a similar mentor in you. Uh, so your name came up on the program, and it was, it was very exciting for me and exciting for both of us to talk about kind of the importance of relationships and, and mentors in the industry. So I'm, I'm thrilled to, to have a conversation with, with you today. And I'm also 
also thrilled because uh, you're such an interesting person and professional. Uh, professionally, uh, you've had this very unique opportunity to sit in between both institutional sales and manager research and allocation, particularly funding asset managers. So we, we love bringing in industry veterans like yourself with these hybrid, hybrid back, backgrounds um, so our audience can, can hear from both sides of the table in, in one conversation. So I'll, I'll start the conversation, Mel, by, by letting our audience know that you and I work together at Julius Baer Investment Management uh, for over a decade. Uh, and we're gonna spend some time talking about the rise and close of that organization because uh, we're talking about business cases uh, before we, we went to air. Uh, I think that in itself was a very interesting business case as to how asset managers can grow and how uh, asset managers can close. Um, but before we, we do that, I, I always like to start at the beginning. Uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, taking us uh, back to, to where you grew up and, and how, you, uh, how you initially navigated your way into the industry. Humble, humble beginnings. Grew up in a blue collar beach town called San Pedro, which is part of uh, Los Angeles County. And I would say had a really good sort of childhood um, in the sense that San Pedro was a melting pot. I mean, we had uh, a lot of Eastern Europeans, Yugoslavians, Croatians. Uh, we had some folks from Greece there. We had Mexicans. We had African-Americans, Italians. And the one unique thing about San Pedro is that, you know, it was at the edge of Los Angeles uh, in, in really kind of its own community. And so people didn't come there unless they either worked down at the docks or um, they lived there. And so everyone was needed in the community. So it didn't feel like, you know, as divisive as things are now where, you know, people are so politically divided, they are, um, you know, racially divided. It just felt like it was all about San Pedro and the locals called it Pedro. Um, and, you know, we, we were the Pedro pirates and we acted like pirates. So it was, it was a great place to grow <laughs> up. Um, probably not the place where most people would end up on Wall Street. So I feel, you know, very fortunate that I got a chance to go through like the Dean Witter training program, worked at Shearson Lehman Brothers, and then ultimately transitioned to the buy side at Wells Capital, first starting as an analyst been a portfolio manager, um, got my MBA while I was there, a CFA, which helped me get promoted to a portfolio manager. And so it was an interesting way to sort of navigate, you know, how to get into the business. And now trust me, I got turned down by every single Wall Street firm on the planet when I first <laughs> graduated and just kept applying, kept applying, did internships and just figured out a way how to, you know, just be there and say, whatever you need me to do, you know, I can do. Um, and just try to learn on the job. Um, and so once I was able to get in, um, you know, really just tried to be a student of the business um, mm -hmm. and never worried about, you know, how much money I was making, just wanted to be a student. And one of the things my, my dad taught me when I was growing up is that, you know, your life should be about three things, learning, earning, and returning. And when you're a kid and you're new in your industry, you don't know anything. So just learn as much as you can. Uh, and then if you do that, you don't have to worry about income. You'll earn a premium over your peers and you should never spend all the money you make. You should give some back in return, you know, sit on boards, uh, do some philanthropic work, give back to your church, your community, you know, mentor people. And it's like this universal recycle sign. You know, you learn more mm -hmm. from the people you're mentoring then you're giving to them and you're always staying young and fresh. And, and so, you know, it was, my dad didn't talk much, but when he did, he said some pretty powerful things. And I think that was one mm. of the most powerful things for me. Well, it sounds like he also instilled a lot of perseverance in you. So it, it, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's exciting for us to hear because, you know, having someone who's been able to navigate through their careers very successfully. Um, but we do talk to a lot of people who have faced a lot of barriers, particularly early on in their careers, um, you know, coming from, you could call it a community on the edge, which I, I think is wonderful. I could probably draw a lot of parallels to firms that you've chosen over the years, maybe being on the edge of mainstream Wall Street or mainstream mainstream private banking. But what were some of those, um, you know, what were some of those obstacles you did have to overcome in order to get where you are? If you think about kind of the, the, the characteristics or the character that you needed to, to put forward in order to, to get where, you, where, you, where you've come. You know, I, I, I think the obstacles have actually been um, constructive and helpful. So, you know, when you don't, you know, go to like, 
you know, Harvard, or Yale and Ivy League school and you're, you're working around people who do, you always have this an imposter syndrome. Right. And you're like, man, I hope they don't find out. You know, so you're always you're always <laughs> trying to, you know, continue to learn as much as you can. And, and what you find is that, you know, it's all about acceleration. Right. It's all about working and and learning at a faster pace, you know, post-college than you were, you know, when you're in college. And so, you know, this imposter syndrome just helps you, you know, focus on things and go a lot deeper than may- maybe most people will. And so mm-hmm. it's, it, that's why, you know, when you hire, I think, in building a team, you want to have different backgrounds. You know, you want to have, you know, the typical Ivy League guys. You want to have the guys that maybe went to state schools. You want to have uh, different ethnic backgrounds. You know, people who may have humble beginnings, maybe, you know, who had a little bit more coins in their pocket, you know, when they started off. Mm-hmm. And, and then you get this sort of uh, you get away from group think, um, which is what I think we had a lot of it. Julius Baer. Yeah, I agreed. Well, you know, talking of, of speaking of Julius Baer, you were with Wells for over eight years and then you, you took a risk at, at Drexel. We call it an entrepreneurial calculation, you know, thinking about, you know, what the pros and cons are of a decision. And you joined at the time, you know, Julius Baer, you know, became a $78 billion asset manager, very well known, particularly in international equities. But at the time, it was a, it was a relatively obscure Swiss bank uh, in the United States. So what was the, you know, what was the, the reason for that decision? Decision. How did you come to the decision? What were the what were the attributes of Julius Baer, um, that, you know, that ultimately took you there from what was you know a very successful career path at Wells? You know, it's interesting when when uh, the headhunter approached me to join Julius Baer, I, I had no idea who they were. Um, you know, I had no idea they were a Swiss bank. I don't even think I could mm-hmm. pronounce Zurich. I think I was pronouncing it Zurich. You know, and. Um, <laughs> And when, when they approached me about joining, I said, you know, let me meet the folks. And and I just really wasn't into it. You know, I had a nice, cushy job at, at Wells Capital. I mean, worked really hard. Um, you know, I was managing a sales team after being a portfolio manager on the value equity team. And so I transitioned and I felt like, you know, I kind of earned my dues and uh, got the corner office. And, you know, it was a pretty good, good job. Uh, but it was a job. It wasn't an entrepreneurial experience. And when I joined Julius Baer, you know, I met the team. I met Richard Pell, I met uh, Raymond Baer, met uh, a guy named Riyad Yunus, who I thought was, you know, one of the most brilliant men I ever met. Um, and I said, you know what? I really like these guys. Um, they didn't have much in the way of AUM, no institutional accounts, um, but they were super, super passionate about taking care of the client. And, you know, I worked at Wells and, you know, Wells, Wells was concerned about the client, but not in a way that Julius Baer was. You know, it was all about not just benchmark managing strategies. It was what's the bat strategy for the client. And I, I, I think for me, it it really harkened back to business school. When I took venture initiation, you do all these business models and you do the value chain. Mm-hmm. And I had this professor in marketing. And if your value chain didn't start with the client, you got an automatic fail, you know? And so <laughs> I felt like Julius Baer would have passed, you know, flying colors, you know, this guy's class because they started with the client, their product started with the client. They wanted to make sure that they were adding value, you know, for the plumber, the pipe fitter, you know, whoever had an account with them. Well, today we would call it an emerging manager. So less than a billion dollars in assets under management, um, not uh, really established institutionally, as you described with a presence. So what were you, you know, what were you coming into? What were you recruited for? And once you were in the seat, um, you know, who were you joined by? And, and how did you think about tackling uh, you know, essentially the world. I mean, I understand it was a North American target market initially, um, but it, it's a it's a very big menu of items to choose from. When you're coming into an organization uh, that's relatively small, you've got success in a key product, um, but you have to take it to market. So what was that process like for you when you came into that role, um, presumably with colleagues, and really had to think about what is our plan to action? Yeah, and and it, and it was really you know blocking and tackling. Now, keep in mind, we made a lot of mistakes. Um, you know, <laughs> when I first joined, we didn't have uh, what was called AMR compliance at the time. 
Um, we really didn't have uh, what I believe the proper vehicles. Uh, we had a mutual fund and we had a separate account, but no institutional clients. Um, but I had we had a really talented team, passionate folks, uh, and a great track record. Um, and then uh, we also had support from the parent who said, you know, here's some money to run your business and we'll leave you alone. And you guys figure it out in North America. They were in, you know, Zurich, Switzerland. And so, mm -hmm. you know, Richard Pell and, and I and, and a couple other folks just sat around the table and we said, you know, what we need to do, because we didn't qualify for any emerging manager programs because we were owned by a Swiss bank, even though we were an emerging manager. And we said, mm -hmm. well, we, we need to get one corporate account. We need to get one state of pension plan. We need to get an mm -hmm. endowment and foundation. Um, we need to get a, you know, a DB plan. And once we do that, we can start getting others. And so I think our first uh, pension plan was the state of Hawaii. Uh, they gave us 120 million bucks when we we're only managing maybe 600 million. Um, mm -hmm. They didn't have an emerging manager program either, but I think when we made it to the final after uh, Callum Associates put us in in the uh, in the RFP, uh, we started to get other state up plans, but we had to get one right. And then what we also had was you know focus. Even though we went out and we lifted out teams from Scudder, uh, a guy named Greg Hopper who ran a global fixed income team, we lifted out a team from J.P. Morgan, uh, Lin Chen, and Don Quigley who were running a global. Um, uh, investment grade, Greg was running a global credit. Um, and, you know, a few years later, we lifted out a team from uh, Deutsche Bank. But the first and most important thing we did was focus. We focused on international equity and we got the whole firm to rally around international equity. And, and I don't know if you ever read that book, The One Thing, but I think it's one of the mm -hmm. best books for people who are starting off as entrepreneurs you know, a lot of people have to do list. And this book talks about having a success list. You know, what's going to be the most important things you need to have success? And, and, it, and it takes the, the old rule of the Pareto principle, you know, like 20 percent of your success, you know, is going to come from, you know, 80 or 80 percent of your success is going to be come from, you know, 20 percent of your focus um, or, you know, if people say, you know, 20% of your clients are represent 80% of your revenues. And so this book, the one thing, it takes it to the extreme. It says, what's the one thing? Mm -hmm. Forget the 20%. What's the one thing you need to do today and every day for your success? And I don't think anybody at, you know, Julius Bear read that book, but because it wasn't out yet. But I think what they did do is they did focus on, we need to get international equity scaled. We need to get clients. And if we get those clients, we think we can do a good job for them. So they rallied the entire organization around one thing, and that was the international equity product. And it did very well for clients. And it gave us the halo effect to go out and then raise money for the global fixed income strategy, the global credit strategy, the um, all cap US based strategy. And it also allowed us once we started to scale to hire great people like you, to hire, you know, people in the RFP group, which we didn't have before, to hire people in client service, to hire product specialists. Uh, but if we didn't have those cli clients, we wouldn't have had the revenue to do that. So in, in addition to focus, you know, what else would you attribute to the success of, you know, of the business, of the international equity strategy and these other strategies that you brought on board? You know, we, we get asked the question here a lot, you know, in terms of, you know, what makes a successful sales process? What makes a successful salesperson? And, you know, that it, it's very clear from what Julius Baer achieved, you know, that you and the team were able to capture that in addition to being focused. So what, what other attributes would you say, you know, made for a, a successful initiative at, uh, at Julius Baer? Well, I, I think Julius Baer, unlike any other firm I worked for, um, had speed. Um, so we made quick decisions um, and we um, carried out those decisions very quickly, even even when there were mistakes. And so we failed fast and we got up, kind of dusted ourselves off and went back to the drawing board. And mm -hmm. but we did it quickly. And so if, if we were creating a commingled fund, 
we did it quickly. If if a client had a request, we came, we tried to come back to them, you know, within an hour to fulfill that request. And so when you have the whole firm rallying around, you know, what does it take to satisfy the client? I I think that when um, you know you can really scale your business, and I and I think we we also kind of bought into the philosophy of John Wooden, you know, the famed basketball coach from UCLA who said, be quick, but don't hurry, you know, and we practice doing things quickly. So if you don't practice doing them quickly, when it's prime time, you hurry and you make mistakes. And I think with the fact that we hired good salespeople, I think the fact that we hired, you know, great product specialists, you know, like Andrew Barker, you know, Brett Gallagher was a, um, ran the global portfolio and then he transitioned to be a product specialist. We hired, mm-hmm. you know, Patrick Maldary to be a product specialist for the. And so that kept the guys that were generating the alpha at their desk. Generating alpha for the clients and, you know, the client, they don't worry about alpha beta. They're, you know, they're worried about their pension. Right. And so <laughs> we want to make sure that, you know, if they were doing what they were hired to do, which was really what's the best way to deliver returns so you know these clients can meet their actuarial assumptions yeah no absolutely that makes a lot of sense uh thank you for sharing that so um you you were there for 11 years coming out of the financial crisis a lot like a lot of successful firms you know the foundations of businesses were were shook for a number of different reasons um and you know and and the shake uh for julius bear you know, ultimately they they did come out of it successfully, but it was a few years later that it was sold to Aberdeen. So as you reflect back on those 11 years, you know, what, what were the lessons you learned and have continued to stay with you uh, as, as someone who's now, you know, founded a business as a managing partner and is looking at other asset managers to potentially stake, you know, what lessons in particular have stayed with you that you are now uh, conveying to these, to these newer, newer businesses? You may recall when we first started marketing Julius Baer, the market just didn't understand us. And (laughs) it it didn't understand us because we didn't know what we were doing, right? We didn't know what we were doing from a marketing perspective. And so when you talk to Riyadh and you ask them, you know, tell us about your strategy so we can develop a presentation, you know, are you top down? He said, yes. Are you bottom up? He said, yes. Are you a sector rotator? He said, yes. Do you do short-term trading? Yes. Do you do long-term, you know, investing? So everything was yes, right? And so he was Mm -hmm. doing all those things and institutional allocators didn't want to hear that, right? They wanted to hear a very defined discipline. You're a value investor, you're a growth investor, you know, you're top down, you're bottom up. And what Riyadh was really saying was, you know what? We are top down in emerging markets. And we're bottom up in developed markets. And there's this place right in the middle called Japan where you have to do both. And then you need Mm -hmm. to be able to think about where every country is on this spectrum. Are they more developed or are they more emerging? And so the one thing that stuck with me about that is that that applies to sales as well. You know, what's the best sales tactic? You got to be top down in terms of where do you believe, as Wayne Gretzky would say, the puck is going Where's the money flow going? And money flow can be divided in the three distinct buckets. One is money in motion, where's the search activity now, and where all your efforts should be to try to capture those dollars if you have a competitive strategy. The second bucket is market share grab, where you look at the major competitors who may be underperforming or may be having legal issues. And at the time, you know, Putnam was having a legal issue with the late day market timing scandal, and we were able to capitalize on that. But there was another group of investors that were in the bottom 40 percent of their peer group that were also underperforming. And we felt we could target them to gain market share. And then there were the Mm -hmm. clients that were more we call the longer term um, sales, which were missionary strategies. Um, They haven't really embraced that top down, bottom up approach. But if we provided education and white papers, they will soon come around. So we called it missionary work. And to be able to look at all your strategies in your firm and put them in one category or another, are they a money in motion category, are they a market share category, or are they a missionary category? 
And so if you combine the top down where the money flows are going, you can accelerate and scale your business faster than your competitors are. And then from a bottom up perspective, we said, OK, what's how do we sell this strategy? You know, what's what's going to be the main components and what does the team need? And then we, we, we developed this thing called Tides, which is, you know, what's the talent? We have to prove to people we have skill versus luck. What's the innovation? We had to prove to people that combining emerging and developed markets with a top-down and bottom-up approach was more innovative. What's the diversity? We had to prove that we had people from different nations representing different flags, so we got rid of groupthink. You know, we had to prove we had the capacity. And when we ran out of capacity on International Equity One, we created International Equity Two, so we could scale. We had economies of scale. And then we had to prove we can get back to them quickly, so we had the speed. So this TIDES acronym is the one thing we carried through from Julius Baer to uh, now Nile Capital. And every time Mm -hmm. we're looking at taking a stake and a manager, do they fit our TIDES model or could they from a bottom-up perspective? And is there money flow and their strategy from a top down? So you could have the best TIDES manager, but if no one wants to buy it, if there's no money flow, uh, you'll be trying to market that firm for years. Do you find it's more difficult in today's environment to find the time to educate LPs? It's it just seems like it's it's busier than ever. There are more managers calling on LPs than uh, it feels like ever before. At least that's what we hear anecdotally from other sales professionals and from the LPs, the allocators themselves. Is that the, the volume of inquiries is almost overwhelming? So how how as a salesperson do you find the ability to be able to you know particularly in in that missionary work, you know to to, to to dedicate the time or and get the time back. Yeah. So for the missionary, you got to think long term. You, you you don't try to. Uh, the the way we say it is, um, you know, there's different types of investors, right? There's early adopters. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's pioneers, uh, and then there's people who come along later. Um, you know, after, and then there's people who are going to be what we call imitators, where they kind of imitate what everyone else is doing in terms of allocation. And so mm-hmm. when you're working with missionary strategies, you got to find the early adopters. And those tend to be family offices. Um, they tend to be um, endowments and foundations. Uh, and and some, you know, pension plans, whether it's uh, uh, public funds or corporate DBs, You got to find the people who have demonstrated an ability to be innovative in their portfolio. And that comes through just having relationships and talking to people Mm -hmm. and not really trying to sell them, but believing in your strategy and listening more than you're talking. Because they'll they'll tell you what they want and you just got to figure out how to package it, you know, to satisfy that need. Have you always been a good listener? No, I don't I don't I don't think so. But I've always tried to be a good listener, Uh, you Mm -hmm. know, because. You know, when when you're when you're growing up and you're trying to figure out, you know, how to market stuff, you you want to tell your story, right? You want to get out there. And so I, I used to read every single sales book I could find, whether it was from Brian Tracy, Zig Ziglar, um, I used to read negotiating books, Roger Dawson, The Art of Negotiation. Um, I read this book called The Closers that taught you how to close, you know, every nationality, every um industry executive. And, and then what I learned through all that is that it's not about sell skills. You know, it's about taking care of the client and believing in your strategy. And if you're at a firm mm-hmm. where you really don't love the product and love the people, you should just leave. Um, and when I was at Julius Baer, every day I was like, I would probably do this for free. I know that sounds crazy, <laughs> but I really love the people or at least, you know, make enough money to pay the bills. Um because uh, I took a pay cut when I went to Julius Baer when I left Wells. Mm-hmm. And um, I just love the people. I love the strategy. And I knew if we did a good job, the, the economics would take care of themselves. Yeah, I, that's a lesson uh, you taught me many years ago and I've carried with me, uh, which is why I continue to get paid less and less every year. Mel, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. <laughs> so what happens? You've made me into a teacher. Hey, you're, but you're no, doing it, God's it, work. It, thank you. It, thank you. It was very good advice, though, and I, I, did, I did take that. Now, I appreciate you sharing all that. So you 
but you you know it's funny, interesting. So you, you continued that trajectory. It was only for a year at Investec. So I, I I'm sure a lot of those fundamentals that you had developed while you were at Julius Baer you, you took into Investec. But presumably something was going on in the background. You were really thinking about doing something new, something entrepreneurial, taking a new step uh, to forming Nile Capital. So w- what was that process like for you? You know the the ideation of thinking about doing your own thing, starting your own business. Um, how, did, how did you approach that, you know, that decision and, and, and what helped you finally pull the trigger? The journey was, I think, more important than the final destination, quite honestly. And you know, when I joined Julius Baer, I think I was the first North American employee in that Julius Baer LLC that we had to create. Um, I don't even mm-hmm. think Richard and Riyadh were in it yet. Um, and we, we, we created the LLC. We got the backing, um, from the bear family. Um, we started lifting out these teams from other organizations. We moved Richard and Riyadh and Stefano Gali into, uh, this newly formed LLC. Um, and then we just started, you know, sort of blocking and tackling and making mistakes, but we, we knew that we had the talent. We just had to figure out you know, how to grow the business. Uh, and so as as we were scaling Julius Bear, the the ride was so much fun. And then when I joined uh Investec, Investec was a great company, uh very well established in, in uh South Africa and they were building a North American business. Uh, but I was itching to do what we did at Julius Bear again. Um it was mm-hmm. just and so I I talked to Richard Pell you know, who was the CIO, CEO. And I said, Richard, you know, why don't we go out and, you know, find teams that, you know, we can put our own money into, take a minority stake, uh, teach them what we learned at Julius Baer. We had over 400 institutional accounts and relationships from all types of clients. Uh, we, we think this Tides framework worked. We understand money flow analysis. There are a lot of firms that are like, you know, you and Riyadh, when we first started, and they just need help in figuring out this institutional landscape. And I think if we can get them to sell us a piece of their business, and if they have, you know, an innovative strategy, I believe we can scale it. And, you know, we had a decent exit at Julius Baer, you know, while it was, you know, publicly traded and, you know, before the um, assets started to decline. Um, And, so we just said, look, let's see if we can do it again. Let's see if it was the jockey or the horse. You know, was it the Julius <laughs> Bear name or was it, you know, us blocking and tackling? And he was all in. Yeah. You know, and then we got Prasad to come over and Brett and he in. Uh, and so we had a good portion of the management team at at Julius Bear to really start now. And they were all willing to put up their own money, which was amazing. They all believed in it. And, you know, Rob, you were there. You saw the movie, right? And If you look at the rise that we had in such a short period of time, unless you experienced it, it's hard to believe it can be done. And and I think we experienced something pretty phenomenal. And we said, look, let's find, you know, let's be asset class agnostic. Let's find, you know, 12 to 15 firms that we can invest in. Uh, We'll start with our own capital. And then, you know, if it works, we'll raise outside capital. And we were fortunate Mm -hmm. enough to... uh, Get Jose Feliciano, who runs Clear Lake Capital, to also believe in our, our strategy. And he gave us GP and LP Capital. Then we got a few insurance companies. Uh, we got a family office uh, that made their money from owning another asset management firm, which I'm extremely proud about, you know, because they understood the asset management business. People who made their money in asset management understand our model. Um, mm-hmm. And and so it, it it took a while to get off the ground. We struggled. Um, you know, it's when you have a new strategy um, with an old firm, you can scale it. When you have a new firm with an old strategy, you can scale it. When you have a new firm and a new strategy, it's almost impossible to scale. And then, you know, factor in the, you know, I'm black, right? So, you know, we weren't getting, <laughs> black people weren't getting a lot of allocations if they own the firm from, um, you know, the typical pension plan, even though we're the exact same team from Julius Bear, 
it was still hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I think uh, minorities represent about 0.7 of the total allocations from institutional and women represent about 0.7. Um, so 1.4% of the total assets, and this is not me saying this, this is the Knight Foundation who did the study, are with yeah. minority firms. So we were a new strategy, new firm, you know, GP stakes and a minority firm. So it's almost impossible. But, you know, again, you, you have to do the missionary work. And the missionary work is educating people about the strategy. The challenges it can be for minorities. Yet you decided to GP stake minority owned, minority and diverse owned firms. So talk to us a little bit about the mission. Strategic Global Advisors, you know, female majority owned, Denali Capital, uh, Native American owned. So even though you knew those hurdles were present for you, having experienced them yourself, you still decided to allocate towards diverse and women owned firms. What was the genesis of, of that mission? And, you know, why did you choose that path? The path kind of chose us. Uh, so when Richard and I sat down, we, we basically said, we're going to go out and find the best firms we could find and the, each particular asset class. And they have to be innovative. So when we talked to SGA, uh, you know, Cynthia Tucson was running a firm that I thought was, you know, pioneering. She started, you know, sort of quantum mental. She seamlessly combined hmm. fundamental analysis and quantitative analysis. So she had, you know, some graduates from MFE programs. Masters of Financial Engineering, you know, got students from Cal Berkeley and UCLA and other schools that had those programs. But she also had people that had very good fundamental PhDs from Northwestern. Um, and they they were able to combine, you know, fundamental and quantitative, I think, like no other firm had done. And she just happened to be a woman. Right. And she happened to have a diverse team. Uh Bob Snigaroff, he you know, wrote a paper with Harry Markowitz and did some work on what's called network value. Um, and that network value was showing that it wasn't just the Fama and French approach to, to understanding you know, stock and prices, but he said, what about liquidity and the role of liquidity, which he called network value? You know, there's liquidity or lack of liquidity in private equity. Um, but there's a lot of liquidity in public equities and public securities. And what role does that liquidity play in the asset pricing model? And he did a lot of pioneering work there. And if you look at his strategies, the, when you have fine firms that go from less liquidity to more liquidity, they tend to outperform their peer group. Um, hmm. And so that pioneering work. And then we, you know, then we bought a, a stake in a company called Convergence. Again, small unknown firm and um, down in um, West Palm Beach, Florida. And they had a strategy, uh, um, uh, a biased, long, short mutual fund that didn't have a carry that had a five star morning star ranking and no one was buying it. Um, and mm-hmm. it was, you know, it was delivering, you know, 95 percent of the returns of the S&P with 60 percent of the beta. Uh, and they converted it to an ETF mutual fund. Um, and so it was tax efficient and they could lower the fee on that. Uh, and so they had all these innovative strategies, but they all happened to be, you know, diverse. And then we we did uh, a stake in a company called Wilshire Lane, African-American guy originally from Ghana. Uh, he was in the prop tech space, worked at Fifth Wall, worked at Andreessen and Horowitz, got cut his teeth uh, working um at Morgan Stanley in the real estate group. Mm-hmm. And then he ran a, uh, was part of the hedge fund group at Carlisle. And so he had this really diverse background, Harvard undergrad, Harvard Business School, well-credentialed. Uh, but his structure of his business wasn't right. So we went in and we restructured the business. And actually, Harvard Business School wrote a case study about it, which I can, I can share mm-hmm. with you. Uh, and so we were finding all these diverse managers, even though we were, our goal was to look for innovative strategies and mm-hmm. the people who weren't getting assets were these diverse managers who had these innovative strategies who were trying to scale their business. So that's why I said it found us, not necessarily <laughs> we finding them. 
No, it's, I was going to ask you how you're sourcing these ideas because obviously it's become very, you know, it's become a big topic in the industry. You know, people are looking for emerging managers or emerging manager programs are, um, you know, growing rapidly, uh, whether it's within an OCIO or a public pension plan. Um, so it, it's interesting to hear that it sounds like I'm sure a lot of it has to do with network and relationships, um, but just looking for the best in class was was a big was a big uh, a big tailwind for you all. So that makes a lot of sense to us. Yeah, and, and you could source people from you know publicly you know available databases like Investment Alliance. There's emerging manager programs where you can look for talent. There's Prequin. Uh, you know, there's a lot. I'm not trying to do a commercial for any of these folks, but there's there's <laughs> okay. um, there's there's ways where you can use current data out there. And then also, you know, I sit on the board of UCLA uh, Endowment, the UCLA Investment Company. We manage about, you know, $4 billion. And, you know, you see managers there, you know, uh, sit on the board of uh, California Healthcare Foundation, California Community Foundation. You know, we work with consultants. So you see a lot of presentations. You see big managers, small managers, media managers, and there's managers that need help. They need help scaling. Um, and also, you know, I've known you know a lot of consultants, and they're managers that they want to approve, but they haven't scaled to the point where they can really give them a lot of capital. And those consultants know what we do, and they call us and they say, "Mel, have you taken a look at X Y Z manager?" That's why we we actually got Denali. We got Denali from uh, uh, PCA, um, mm. uh, which is now called Makita. But you know, yeah, they yeah. said, you know, Mel, we we think Denali could use your help. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. So as you're thinking about it, that's the interesting part, uh, you know, I think where you, where you sit today, um, you know, you are sitting on a few boards, uh, so you get to uh, really see the manager underwriting process as it, as it operates, UCLA, California Health. Um, so if you could talk to us a little bit about, you know, what, what do those underwriting processes look like from your perspective as a board member? Um, you know, what have you learned from those processes? And then what are you applying uh, to, to your work at Nile? When you're, I guess, what, what was it, the, the line from Hamilton in the room where it happens? You know, when, <laughs> when you're in the room where it happens and you take your investment manager hat off and then you sit and you put your asset allocator hat on, you know, there's real things you're trying to solve for. You know, at UCLA, we're trying to create the best environment for the students and we're trying to make sure that, you know, our research is leading edge for the different, the engineering school, the medical school, the business school, um, you know, the life sciences. And so when you're solving for real life issues, you want to find the best people and the best partners who can help solve for that. Right. And then so you're, you're trying to find the managers that you believe have something that's unique about their approach. And then you really believe that their skill um, as you're underwriting them. And so when the consultants come to you with these different managers, you, you want to challenge them. And on all these boards, there's you know people who've been in the asset management industry. They're pretty sophisticated investors, and they all take their investor hat off and put on the mission alignment hat. And what I'm finding is that you know the mission alignment for St. St. John's Hospital is different from the mission alignment of UCLA, which is different mm -hmm. from the mission alignment for California Community Foundation, and. So we are trying to solve for, you know, California Community Foundation, the underserved community. And we need to have money for that. And that, uh, we had a goal of giving away a billion dollars over a 10-year period. We gave away a uh, billion over eight years, mm -hmm. right? We, we, so we beat our goal mm -hmm. to underserved communities. Um, and, you know, at St. Saint, Saint, Saint John's Hospital, you know, it's really about understanding What's, how do we provide the best health care for all communities? Um, and, you know, how do we get to health equity at California Community Foundation? And so when you're really trying to solve a problem, it's not about, you know, MOIC or IRR or, you know, beta or alpha. You know, the doctor doesn't care about that. The doctor cares about, <laughs> am I going to have enough funding to try to cure this cancer? Right. And. You know, or am I going to have enough money to make sure we get the right students at UCLA? That's what they care about. And so it's really about downside protection 
And then when there's opportunity to make money in the markets, are we positioned to do that? You know, what advice would you give to asset managers is really try to understand the allocator you're targeting. You know, don't show up not informed. You know, know as much as you can. You know, the internet is good and it's bad. It's good because it's speeded up the pace and everyone expects things now. Um, and that's why that's why it's bad. But it's good because you can get so much information about your client and about. So you should never be ill informed when you show up. You know, you should have <laughs> some good information. Then, even though you have that, ask a lot of questions. No, absolutely. Well, you quoted John Wooden earlier, and I think one of his quotes is failing to prepare is preparing to fail. So it's good to go in prepared for sure. Well, it's not another interest. Another interesting you know, aspect of where you sit today is you also get exposure to a lot of different consultants. So you're seeing consultants from a different angle. So as you think about, again, the evolution of this industry, I, I, think, I think I'm partially obsessed with it, just how, you know, the, the, the industry has evolved since at least I started. You know, I started in the late 90s. I've seen a few crises, but I've seen the, this, this evolution of the way that we present our strategies, the way that we sell our strategies as it relates to fees, uh, the way that advisory relationships work, uh, either partially discretion, full discretion. Um, you know, how, how have you seen that consultant relationship evolve now sitting in kind of this unique seat of speaking to consultants about potential investment opportunities and also sitting to consultants about advice as it relates to um, you know, the boards that you're, you're, you're sitting on? Yeah, and and I think the the way you have to view consultants, a lot of people view consultants as gatekeepers, and I try to view them as strategic partners, um, because ultimately we're all trying to solve for the client's needs, goals, and objectives. And when you approach consultants, you got to recognize that they're super busy; they're getting a gazillion emails. Uh, they have to evolve with the industry. Um, you know, they're in a lot of cases they're not getting you know. Ad valorem fees. Uh, it's not based on the assets that they manage. It's based on more of a contract. Uh, and so, knowing that, you got to make sure that you're adding value to the consultant. And if you just have me too products, uh, you're not adding value. Uh, and so, you got to make sure that your product offering is actually pushing the efficient frontier up and out. Right. You want to make sure that if you're talking to them about a strategy, it's complementary to what they're doing. It's not, you know, just a strategy where they can just get off the shelf and shelf and, and buy, you know, beta. And so when you approach consultants, you got to help them help their clients. And that's why I say don't look at them as gatekeepers, look at them as, you know, strategic partners. And I think when you do that in your long term and you don't waste their time. And you you approach them with something that can really add value where they can feel comfortable. If they take a risk with you, uh, they're not going to get fired um, because that's real. Right. Uh, it's a super competitive environment. And I would say you just treat consultants as strategic partners. And I think it's evolved where they're, you know, they're getting bigger. You know, a lot of bigger consultants are gaining most of the market share. Um, and they're trying to you know, appear to not have conflicts of interest with their own product. So you got to make sure you're providing some value to those consultants. It's great advice, Mel. Thanks so much. Well, as we're getting close to the top of the hour, I had opened up the show by saying uh, how valuable the advice you've given me over the years has been, and I appreciate it greatly. So as you think about your, you know, your own network of mentors, the people, in addition to your father, which I, I appreciate you sharing with us, um, who have impacted you, who have helped you, um, you know, better understand who you are and, and what is best for you, uh, whether it's a mistake or a success, you know, who are some of those people in your life? Oh man, there's been so many, um, you know, I would say Mark Kazanoff, who started progress investment management. Um, mm -hmm. you know, Mark's will be the first to tell you about all the mistakes he made in life. And I think that's what good mentors do because, you don't put them on a pedestal, but you take their advice. And he's been super successful, uh, you know, worked in the Carter administration, started an asset management firm, worked focusing on emerging managers. Um, Bob Bissell, who was at Wells Capital, uh, he was the one that I felt saw more in me than I ever saw in myself. I mean, every time there was an opportunity to do a job or a project, he tapped on my shoulder. You know, when we were rebranding 
Wells Fargo Investment Management Group to Wells Capital. You know, I was part of that committee. Um, when we launched into the institutional side from the private wealth side, I was part of that team. You know, when we started merging Norwest Investment Management Group and First Interstate Investment, I was always on the integration team. And so it allowed me to cut my teeth on the business of asset management, not just being a portfolio manager, not just being a sales, but the business of asset management. And I would have never had that, I think, you know, lens that he gave me and the opportunity he gave me, you know, to do that. And so I'm, you know, eternally grateful to him. And he didn't look like me. A lot of times people pick mentors that look like themselves, you know. He was, you know, middle-aged white guy that went to UVA that was, you know, super smart, the CIO of um, Wells Wells Capital and ultimately, you know, the president. Um, you know, and, and and so along the way, I've had people, you know, whether it was Dale Brown, who I worked with at Wells Capital, who actually did look like me uh, at Wells Fargo mm-hmm. Bank. Uh, he always took the time to, you know, answer my phone call. I'd ask him stupid questions and You know, he made me feel like there was never a stupid question. And so just, you know, there's so many people. And I would say never underestimate anybody based on how they look and never overestimate anybody. Just try Mm -hmm. to go into a situation and learn people, you know, and you just never know what they can bring to the table, you know. And, And your mentors could actually be bad people, too. Because you learn what not to do. Yeah, it's um, it's funny you said that. I, I asked the same question. Um, it was, I'm scratching my head because I'm trying to remember. It was at Joe Miranda uh, from Cambridge Associates. He oversees digital asset investing. And I asked them a very similar question. It was funny. That was actually his first answer was, you know, as much as I, I've had some great people in my life, it's the bad ones who are in my head right now not to do that. I don't want to treat an employee that way. I don't want to make that kind of decision based on that type of information. So it, that's, I, I think that's a fantastic point. Very, uh, yeah, consistent with a couple other folks I've heard from. Yeah, because I think you you learn, you actually learn more from those folks than people just giving you the pie in the sky. You can do it, you know, um, sort of philosophy. You need those, you know, you need, I hate to say this, but you need the good and the evil. Yeah. No, it's funny. I mean, we actually, yeah, no, exactly. And I, I could have framed, um, I, I agree. And I could have framed the Julius Baer years in a very similar way. As much as I learned uh, between 2002 and 2008, the, the real experience came from 2010 to 2012, you know, when it was very difficult and challenging. The real relationships came in those two years. And I don't mean real in the sense that they were, you know, um, uh, you know, any less important than the earlier relationships, but the conversations that were were really difficult. You know, it's difficult for people to fire people. It's difficult for people uh, to let people down, give bad news. And I think those lessons have, have at least stayed with me. Um, and usually in my career, the folks that I've been through those lessons with, like yourself, you know, are the ones I'm, I'm, I'm l- very lucky to say that I still speak with today. Yeah, no, we 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 had a great. Uh, I call it our our Julius Bear tribe. Um, you know, it was <laughs> phenomenal. It, it's hard to explain. Um, yeah, and and it was those lessons that we learned, and you know, and we you know we went from a a private company where you know we could have so much fun, do whatever we want, generate alpha. You know, everyone was working hard to a publicly traded company where the spotlight was always on us, and I I would say the one thing is. When companies are thinking about doing that, make sure you really get some publicly traded experience because it's a totally different environment going from, you know, private to public. And, you know, every time you made an announcement, you had to make it, you know, a public announcement. When you're private, you don't have to do that, you know, if you're transitioning things. So Mm -hmm. that, that was a big lesson learned there. So Mel, last question. As you think about your current roster of asset managers, are there any asset classes that uh, you're, you're focused on today? You'd like to see a manager knock on the door and, and potentially introduce you to something uh, that's currently burning you know, on the stove at Nile? Yeah. So, so as banks are getting out of more of the direct lending and the, you know, the private credit side, uh, we think there's a void to be filled by private credit managers. And there's so many unique strategies that we've been talking to. Um, and, and, and they're not just me too private credit and, and direct lending. 
Um, they, there are some pretty interesting companies. Um, we also think emerging markets are on sale. Um, they've been underperforming for quite some time. Uh, you know, when we had the strong dollar, it, it just seemed like it was a huge buying opportunity to go in and look at, you know, some unique emerging market managers. Uh, the challenge is trying to find a platform where they can really scale the business and still deliver alpha. Um, so we like that. We like the the private credit in the emerging market space, the Middle East and Africa. We think that's a huge opportunity um, to deliver some returns. We don't think they have the big run up in valuations like venture and and private uh, equity had here in the in North America and in developed Europe. Uh, so we think there's huge opportunity there, and we're talking to a lot of those managers. You know, we have a lot of risk mitigation strategies on our platform. We have Welton Investment Partners. Global Macro Fund that's done really, really well for us. Um, we have uh, Britannia, which is a structured uh, 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 credit shop out of uh, London. Uh, we have Kasir, which is a machine learning AI firm. You know, all the talk right now is about AI and chat GPT. And, and they were creating it before, you know, Microsoft got really big and start making announcements. So we felt like we were mm-hmm. on the forefront of that. So we're just trying to round out the portfolio with these different, you know, performance diff- driven asset classes and managers. Um, but no, we still got some voids to fill. Yeah. Well, good. Thank you for sharing that. We appreciate it. Mel, thank you for taking time to be here today. I'm sorry you couldn't come to Philadelphia, but this is uh, still a great way to see you and, uh, and share your expertise and experience with our audience. So thank you and congratulations again on all your success. Thank you and congratulations to you and Dakota. Looking forward to seeing you thrive. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that, Mel. Well, if you want to learn more about Mel and Nile Capital, please visit their website at www.nilecapitalgroup.com. You can find this episode and past episodes on Spotify, Apple, Google, or your favorite podcast platform. We are also available on YouTube if you prefer to watch while you listen. If you'd like to catch up on past episodes, check out our website at dakota.com. Finally, if you like what you're seeing and hearing, please be sure to like, follow, and share these episodes. Uh, We welcome your feedback as well. Mel, thanks for being here. And to our audience, thank you for tuning in. Don't say goodbye.